Right, folks, without further ado, good afternoon to you. Welcome. My guest today is fascinating. He has a rich history. He's done a whole bunch of different things. He's sailed around the world. He's a chef. He's a pilot. He builds airplanes. He has a degree in tourism and financial management. He's passionate about wildlife. He's also been part of a team that has won the America's Cup. My name is Alex MacPhail and this is High Performance Teams. Terry, a very good afternoon to you. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Very well. Thanks very much for having me, Alex. Nice. Now, you're down in Nelspreet. Uh, I heard a bit of buzzing around there. Are, are things in full swing there? I heard an airplane fly off a second ago. Uh, unfortunately, not yet. So we, we can't wait to be ungrounded. But um, there was a chopper that just flew by a few seconds ago, a police chopper um, on the scout for rule breakers. Um, and we, we are privileged to be sitting on the top of a mountain and um, looking out for aircraft, as we do quite often. And I'm um, having this discussion with you. Okay, great, Terry. Well, uh, before we sort of get into the meat of it, I know there's been a tragedy. So uh, um, if you want to just share the plight of uh, the rangers that you quite uh, eagerly and keenly support up in Virunga, I'm going to just take a moment to just discuss what's, what's happening there, please. Yeah, thanks, man, Alex. Um, yeah, on Friday last week, around lunchtime, um, there was an attack on a, on a convoy, um, a very close friend of mine, his platoon was basically entirely wiped out. Um, Twelve of the rangers have died so far, some of the drivers and four civilians. Um, four, four rangers in critical condition in hospital. Um, and it is an ongoing concern. And these guys that uh, basically commit their lives to trying to save mountain and um, lowland gorillas in very hostile environments, um, continue to be massacred and this is the biggest massacre ever in the history recorded uh, of rangers um, so if everyone can keep them in their thoughts and maybe if guys are interested in helping them out there is a, a rangers fund for the families of the rangers it's um, simple enough it's virunga.org forward slash donate if guys are keen that would that would help a lot and we'd really appreciate it Okay, thanks. Yeah, so our thoughts do go out to those families of the of the, the rangers doing their bit to protect the animals, and then in turn they've been taken out. The connection, the, the link will be in the show description at the end if you want to get involved in your support to these families, the rangers. I know over the years there's been uh, over 700, 750 odd rangers and more than 175 of them have been attacked and killed. So uh, our thoughts do go out to them. We're going to come back to uh, the anti-rhino poaching and the wildlife side of, of manufacturing aircraft. But let's just take a moment to just uh, rewind a few years now, if you like, Terry. Take us back to the last couple of years. I know you were uh, an alumni of Boys High, some, uh, some real uh, success stories coming out of Boys High, Pretoria. Uh, talk us through your sort of high school years and, and how you got excited and in, in getting into a variety of things that we're going to discuss shortly. Yeah, yeah so I um, went to the greatest school on the planet. Um, <laughs> met a lot of good guys. Um, made great friends, um, struggled through the boarding side of Pretoria Boys High, and um, afterwards decided to study veterinary. Um, it was some some challenges there, basically like starting at Boys High in Form 1 again, right from the bottom. So it didn't last too long there, unfortunately. Um, and then decided to go overseas and study to to become a chef. Traveled the world for, for quite a while until we, we, we got to New Zealand, which you, you're going to discuss just now, what happened in New Zealand. Um, and then, yeah, so after circumnavigating the planet about, in about five years, I jumped back off the boat and came home and started studying and, and all the rest of what we are going to be discussing on, on the ship. But that's, the, that's the, the short and sweet version of the long story. <laughs> okay, I know there's a lot of uh, Pretoria old boys uh, listening in now, and I'm sure they'll be smiling there in agreement with this uh, greatest school on the planet yeah. story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Terry, before we, before we go any deeper, let me just put this little video clip, because I think you've glossed over a little bit here. So uh, folks, just have a look at this video clip, and we can discuss in more detail about high-performance team. Swiss Challenge, can society not keep the 
in its first right challenge there. to the Americans Cup, <laughs> led by Ernesto Bernabelli and skipped by Russell Cook, wins America's Cup 2003, beating defender in New Zealand Friday Hill. Sailing's biggest prize has a new home, Switzerland. Okay, so uh, Terry, you've uh, you, you're a part of this team, and uh, and I must stress to the folks that you've you've gone at great lengths to assure me that you had a very minor role to play. But the way I see high performance teams is that teams have a very big support base, and there might be a poster boy for certain teams, and there might be a sort of the frontline operations, but certainly providing the sustenance to the crew. You were a chef on that team that won that year. Tell us about your experience of being part of the America's Cup. Well, it's like the Formula One of yacht racing. Yeah, Alex, uh, just listening to those, the elation after, after winning, it brought back a lot of great memories. We, um, we, we were not very well liked in New Zealand. We um, had a lot of the Team New Zealand sailors sailing for us. Um, we, were, we used to get bombarded with um, fruit and vegetables <laughs> on our way out of the viaduct basin every morning. Um, and we had, the boss was a really, really cool guy. Um, and he had the biggest speaker system installed in the camp. And we used to play that Red Hot Chili Peppers song that goes, dang, 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 as loud as possible that the whole, it would wake up the whole of Auckland if no one was, if everyone was still sleeping. And um, just completely rubbing it in. And um, yeah, we, we kind of eased through the competition. Um, thousands and thousands of boats on the water every day. Navigating is, is chaos. Um, and and when it came down to the finals, you know everyone was obviously nervous. Um, new Zealand tried a lot of new strategies, um, mm -hmm. stuff that they that they hadn't properly tested um, right to the final, and or properly tested with the conditions that they were faced during the finals. And um, the the wake and the swell of all the the boats, all the spectator boats, was never taken into consideration. And their new experiment called the hula, which was a split hull at the back to keep the boat's surface tension on the water, um, actually resulted in them being unsuccessful. And, and obviously, we had the best team in the America's Cup. But those two parts, those two parts together, it was uh, played, played, played a role in, in letting us raise the, raise the oldest sporting trophy in the world. Okay, well, I don't, I'm not really uh, um, so familiar with all the details of it. I know it's a prestigious prize, and I know that there's a, I mean, certainly, the, you know, when I talk about the Formula One of yacht racing, um, Adrian Newey, the sort of best designer of, of all time in Formula One aerodynamicist, he has gone across into getting, getting heavily involved in yacht racing. But let's just go back a, a step or two. So after school, you decided to go studying, and uh, that wasn't working out for you. You couldn't take the sort of uh, the approach to the boarding side of things, but not the studying was a whole different thing. But let's then say, well, what's the next step? You go overseas and you get a job on a yacht, and that is with the same boss of the team. And uh, and he's he was very kind to you. Shared some stories. So how did that all set out? Where, where, where did that begin for you? Yeah. So um, dock walking. Being a dock rat, um, just like starting from scratch, very very humbling experience if anyone's ever done it before. Um, and I met a, a gentleman by the name of Neil Sh Neil Sherman. One day, early in the morning, you got to try be the first guys on the dock, otherwise you never get work there. And um, he said, "Oh, he's, the chef is the chef has gone off. Um, can, do I know how to cook?" So I said, "Yeah, you know, I, I can make like eggs and toast." <laughs> so I said, come, come on, come on board. You'll give me a hundred dollars to cook breakfast for the crew. So I said, okay. <laughs> and then I never, I never left. I never left the boat. The, um, the boss was very generous and, and he paid for me to go on private tuition um, in all the countries that we traveled around the world, like having one-on-one -on -one to learn all the different cuisines. And, um, and not only that, he, he, he paid for my pilot's license, for my skipper's ticket, for, for every single thing that, that you wanted to do to learn, you know, he, he, he's the type of person that would, would have satisfaction in, 
expanding people's knowledge and trying to make them more successful. So, so, so we, I can land with my bum in the butter, and um, and I, I still I'm forced to cook because my my wife um can she can burn a piece of toast. <laughs> she's she's lovely. Other than that, so I have to cook at home to stay alive. Um, so I've never kind of stopped cooking, but professionally haven't cooked for since 2004. Okay. Well, look, I also enjoy yeah. enjoy cooking, but uh, I want to just zoom in on a point you mentioned there, you know, in, in flying as well. Uh, obviously, I've got a big aviation audience. Um, the flying thing, you get your you get your license and you're now eligible and they call it the walk of shame with your CV. You walk up and down in and, and some of the bigger airports and try and get yourself a job at, you know, dock walking. I think that's a great point. So you may have ended with your, your bum and the butter, but certainly there's, there's that walk of shame, the dock walking that comes beforehand and putting yourself out there and being available to sweep decks and tie ropes and fry eggs as, as it were. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's very humiliating. Um, the, the one way that I could ensure getting work before that was actually um, scrubbing black tanks, so the, the septic tanks on the boat. So you obviously cover yourself in a full suit like coronavirus, like turbocharged. <laughs> okay. And um, and and every single boat needed someone to clean the black tanks, and and they and they used to it, it kept you alive for for a couple of weeks. Two days work going and cleaning black tanks. So you could go there and you say, do you guys have work? And they say, no, we don't have any work. Sorry. You say, I'll clean your black tanks. Oh, okay, yeah, no, we've got work. <laughs> and then they, you jump on a boat. And, okay. So, so they want to see the, so where this commitment. In me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So let, now you've, you've established yourself. You, you're able to, to do hard work. And then obviously the, there's, a, there's a spark that somebody will resonate with and they'll see that of you. So you get, you get involved. But, but just that approach from your boss, I know you've mentioned a few other stories about him being uh, sort of generous and uh, compassionate as well. And what a wonderful opportunity and an example and a lesson surely for you as well, being, a, being an entrepreneur as well, to look after your staff, you know, particularly in the times that we face today. Um, upskilling your workers and being generous with them along the way. Some key attributes that will you know, uh, put you in a good stead. But let's let's talk a little bit exactly on the the team of the the racing team. You had the team the the yacht was Alinghi, and uh, talk us through what a what a, a racing team looks like. What are the people? I mean, you, you've mentioned Olympic athletes, top 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 flight athletes, and and you're a part of that support staff. So tell us a bit more about the racing team itself. Yeah, great. So, so the reason why I was so concerned, like I didn't want someone to think that I was the grinder, for example, or the tactician, or the navigator, or the helmsman on the boat. But um, I certainly. We kept the we kept the boys cargo loaded uh, when we were out in the water when they couldn't get back to base. We were on the on the mothership, so on the super yacht that was that had held all the important people. And when I say important people, I mean the boss's wife and all of the, all of the the crew's wives on board. So we were we were cooking for 55 of them every day, and then and then the crew of the of the boat um, as well. So so the the team itself is quite complicated. Um, the the boss wasn't just the wealthy man, you know, that was that bought this team. He was very, very, very critically involved in the team and the success of the team. A highly successful um, sailor and um, tactician and navigator, and now a helmsman. Um, then we had um, we had Russell Coots um, and Brad Butterworth, two of the best sailors in the world still, um, Olympic gold medalists. We had. Um, we had we had Olympic we had Olympic gold medalists in the background, not even showing face on the on the team. Wow. Uh, it was it was an extremely powerful team. We we had grinders that for fun you could go into the into like the Lengi Hall, and they they would sit there for fun and have like tourists come in there and just grind against you for fun. And it's and it's 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 hectic exercise that you. I, I I had threw up actually after one <laughs> attempted challenge against one of the grinders. It's it's really really tough, and they do it the whole day. They just go on these grinding okay. wheels. So, okay, so that, yeah, I was going to ask you not what what is a boat. what is a grinder and what is the job? What is the what's required? Okay, okay so, so a grinder is the guy that um, actually um, winds a winch and pulls us pulls the sails up and down essentially. So well, he, the, the down is easy, but pulling it up is it's it's a it's a heavy piece of equipment, and they on the winch and they just pump it. So okay. so they have extreme extreme um, upper body strength, mm -hmm. and um, and seriously religious early morning training and afternoon training and lunchtime training to to be able to keep that stamina to pull the to pull the sails up. It's it's very very difficult. 
Okay, well, all right. Sounds like a sounds like a fascinating thing, and I think maybe even just a conversation we could have exclusively on uh, on America's Cup and and yacht racing. But I want to bring the conversation back to 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 today as well. So at the end of this uh, America's Cup, a great victory. Um, obviously, the celebrations and everything that goes with it. But uh, you've been with this uh, this businessman, this uh, yacht owner, for many years, and you had an arrangement with him. So if once you get around the world, that's where you're going to part ways. So talk us about your sort of yeah, ending so, days with him. Yeah, so it was actually uh, the skipper who's who's his who's our direct line to him. He he came on the boat very little, um, but um, the, yeah. So basically, I got on the boat in Gibraltar ish area and left in Gibraltar, came home and, and I knew a lot of guys get into this industry and, and it's so luxurious and um, extravagant and entrapping um, that you that you, you seldom be, uh, escape. You know, you're so used to living that life and and um, and and the real the real world it's it's a it's a very commonly used phrase, but the real world is is completely different to to that uh, uh, um, of being on the boats, you know, on the super yachts. And so, so it was a it was a huge knock, you know, for us to to come back to normal society and and try and you know from being at the the smartest clubs and pubs in the world. And when you go and pick up the crew car, you know, you can there can be Lamborghinis and Ferraris. It's it's not um, that's nothing. And uh, and then to 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 get home and then you got to like. You got to start from scratch, and that's and that's what we that's what we did, and it was and like, we just carried our experiences with us. That was basically all that we did. Okay, all right. So that brings you back home, back to the the family farm in the Elspreet area, and uh, getting involved with your dad again. At this point, your dad is importing Bantams, that light aircraft from New Zealand, and uh, you had been spent a bit of time in New Zealand from your yacht racing. So uh, he sees an opportunity that to get involved with the family and get involved, and now you've learned to fly as well. And so tell us about this uh, this new journey, getting involved with the Bantams and the importing. Yeah, I mean it was such a lucky thing. You know, it was there were three three people involved there. I wasn't one of them to start off with. It was it was my uncle Michael in Moy River who saw this this little micro lights on on um, on a Discovery Channel. And he phoned my dad and he said, hey, Andrew, uh, we've got to get one of these things. And my dad was jumped on board and he's like, yeah. Um, and he couldn't afford it at the time, whatever the case was. And, and, and he asked my boat, who was also on the boats. My brother was on the, on, the, on the boats as well at that stage. And he said, hey, Q, you know, what do you think? And he's like, yeah, he's flat out his end. So they bought, so my uncle Mike bought one and, and my dad and my boat bought the other one, the first two. And they can, yeah. And during that time, I'd already been in New Zealand and done a basic course in assembling the aircraft, done my pilot's license at the base where the aircraft were built. So I had a kind of good understanding of the aircraft, came back um, and assembled them. And then the next batch that came, the owner didn't even come with. It was actually only a single aircraft. It was built for a paraplegic guy in Nelspreet, um, um, Andre Fuerson, Ritif Fuerson's cousin. Okay. And uh, so we had to build that, that aircraft by ourselves. And it flew, so we thought, yes, it will. Maybe we know what's we know what's happening. Here. Okay. But yeah, the lack of the lack of getting the whole thing started, you know, with my dad and, and my boat and my uncle just seeing it randomly on a TV show to allowing us to penetrate almost every single major game reserve in sub-Saharan Africa. Certainly, it's a there's a huge um, there's a huge step there that that was almost coincidental. You know, it was. It's a, a lucky shot that he turned on a TV show and watched that channel and, and it, all the developments happened from, from that. <laughs> okay, it might have been a lucky beginning, but, but there's a lot of hard work that goes with it. And you mentioned that at some point within a, a short time of doing that, uh, for every 20 airplanes that Bantam is making, you guys are importing 19 of them. So you become almost the sole yeah. supplier of Bantams around the world. Um, and, and obviously in, in Southern Africa, you are... The agent, as it were, and you are Bantam. Yeah, so we had a great relationship with um, the manufacturer and designer of the Bantam aircraft. There were actually quite a few designers that were, but Max Clear, he was the he was the the go-to man and the owner of the factory. Um, we had a great relationship with him, like like you just mentioned. Now, from when we got involved, every twenty that were made, we we did nineteen of them, um, only in Africa. Um, they did the rest of the world, but they did very few. They were really focused on us. Um, Max passed away in 2012, and um, there was 
there was a future for the company, so we went over actually to go and buy the company. And the and the son, who's a, who's a hell of a nice guy, he just wanted too much money. We couldn't afford it, and we couldn't raise the finance for it. And my dad just said, "Let's build our own one." You know, there were so many little things that we wanted to change on it. And I said, "Dad, we can't build our own one. It costs. It will cost us thirty bar. We can't. We can't afford to build our own airplane from scratch." And he said, "No, we'll we'll make a plan. We must. We're definitely going to build our own one." So I said, "Okay." Very, very bleak with the outcome. We flew home all the way home. And, um, yeah, my dad is terrible to travel with because, like, he kept making people search me at the airport. And so I'll never go traveling with, with him again. But we, we got back home, long trip, and um, started the work. And within seven months, we had our prototype flying. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And there was, I mean, there, was, there was quite a lot wrong with it. But it flew, you know, and so so then we knew we we'll tweak it up and we'll make it a a nice aircraft and 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 that's when the hard work started and the certification and dealing with CAA it's very difficult. It always has been, and um, but we managed to get it done. We managed to get our our type certification done in 2013, um, and which and we had only built like 50 amateur built aircraft. So there's not many battles out there that are that are amateur built versus the production built. Okay. And, um, and then we carried on. We started moving. Okay, well, that sounds quite literally like the Burmaka Plan story. Uh, so I'll put a picture <laughs> up of the, uh, of the bat hawk, the white one there, and uh, you flying it along at a bit of altitude just to get a sense of it. So, so there it is now. Essentially, you, you've taken what you liked about the Bantam and you've tweaked and modified the things that you were thinking about improving all along and you put it into the bat hawk. So, so talk us through this uh, airplane here. See, it's got a, a high... Um, the high uh, motor sitting on the top, of, front of the, the the wing on top, it's out of the way. It gives you that easy sort of ground maneuverability, but also visibility for the, you know, the game spotting, etc. Talk us through the things that you made nicer on this aircraft. Yeah, so so you hit the nail on the head there. You know, we and the Bantam also came from those type of beginnings. It was like the Phantom and the Flight Star. They're all similar type of aircraft. The guy takes it, modifies it a little bit, makes it how he wants it, and and so on and so forth. And we did the same thing with the with the bat talk. We we love the the Bantam is a great aircraft still to this day. They are amazing aircraft. Um, we took the Bantam. Um, we knew that it was a bit claustrophobic inside the the cabin. We expanded the cabin, widened it slightly. Um, we beefed up the wings so that we could take a bigger maximum take off uh, maximum all up weight because our our general um, populace in South Africa is rather large, not like the little Kiwis. Um, yeah, and then we we um, we did quite a lot of beefing up to the brake system, the undercarriage, um, the suspension on the nose gear was ours already from from the Bantam days, so um, that that helped. Um, and you were talking about the engine being up, you know, and out of the way. That that has been one of our critical um, aspects for the success that we've achieved. You know, if you land in a in a strip with long grass or something. Or a couple of twigs, and your prop is low to the ground. You you cause chaos. You know we we refer to a true bush plane. There's lots of guys claiming to be bush pilots and stuff like that. We don't claim to be anything like that. We just say that you can take our little airplane and you can land it on a bush road in the middle of a reserve, as most guys do, hundreds of times a day using our, our aircraft, and your your prop is up and out of the way. Your visibility is amazing. You can see what you're doing, and that was kind of it was kind of our biggest um, focus when we were building the aircraft. We were like, who uses our air aircraft? Kruger Park, um, like South African Wildlife College, were those were our two biggest clients at the time. How do we, how do we make the aircraft perfect for those guys? And that was the basis of our of our development of the Bat Talk, and it, and it and it that's why it's uh, so widely used in the wildlife and conservation industry. Okay, well, let me just put this little intro video clip uh, just to, to discuss a few more of those features here. So here's a, an intro of the bat hook.
a nice shot there to end off with you flying with your daughter. So nice, such a wide range of possibilities, a bit of a promotional video. And I know you didn't make it, it comes from a, a fan. And that's it's always nice when the fans of the product really celebrate the product too. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's very much as a, um, like a diverse tool, you know, we've, we've been talking about the work, working aspects of the aircraft, but it's certainly uh, in terms of civil aviation, general aviation, fun aviation, family flying, you know, it's, um, it's, it, fills, it fills those roles quite nicely. And um, yeah, we, because it's so easy to fly, I, I, we, we always, um, when, when we do demos, we usually do demos when there's no COVID-19 pretty much every day. Um, and um, we, one of the tricks that we do is we actually fold, you fold your legs yeah. and do max rate turns uh, without, without touching the rudders, and, uh, and the ball stays right in the middle. And people are like, what? How does that work? And it's just, it works. Try it. And then they try it. And then you can see it's so awkward and their feet are like twitching. They want to touch the pedals. And they very, very stiffly go steeper and steeper and see, wow, the thing can actually do a max rate turn without touching the rudders. Okay, and that's so very, what, uh, yeah, longitudinally yeah. stable. One of so, the applications yeah. is that uh, using this for your surveillance. But uh, so we, we, we talk. We'll come to the Rhino approaching specifically. But but that sort of controllability in uh, in maneuverability. You see something. You're on a on a, a recce, as it were, and a quick turn to get back to the the action. It's it's there. It's one of the bits that people celebrate about the aircraft. Yeah. So um, turning on a ticky certainly is a, is a is a huge aspect that um, our bush pilots. Um, look for, and um, you know, with with a bit with a bit of practice, you get better and better. And literally, turn a, around a carcass or around a bush where the where the tears or the, the 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 poachers would be would be hiding. Literally turning on a ticky and keeping circling there to to mark the exact position of those guys until the ground troops are able to actually access them. Okay, that's good. Well, let's put another little um, a video here. A short takeoff is also a feature. Obviously, it's a light aircraft too. Let's have a look at this takeoff roll. And I, I don't know the, the specifics, but that looked to me somewhere in the order of 50 meters or so. I mean, that's a, it's a very versatile little machine. Yeah, we um, we don't um, do short takeoffs with big wind and uh, like um, like people are privileged to have in Valdez and in Alaska where there's a consistent beautiful wind. Here you can do it, and you think, oh, here's a nice breeze, and we're going to do a really really short takeoff in the next minute. The wind changes direction 90 degrees, and you'll prob probably face plant or something like that. So we 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 generally show people like uh, short takeoffs and landings in realistic situations and realistic tub conditions. And um, so, so usually I, I ask people to show the windsock so they can see, especially in America where they really like the, the stall type of flying, sure. that they can see, look, there's no wind. This is a still, still conditions or a slight breeze, but definitely not a Valdez breeze where you just pull the stick back and you're airborne. Sure. And, you can't, and I don't know if you've seen those aircraft in that case. Like, it doesn't look realistic, but it's real. But the wind is blowing 35 knots the same, but the guys come in like, a, like they've got a parachute on the aircraft. It's the most amazing thing to watch. Yeah, almost, uh, almost in the hover, yeah. Okay, so you, yeah. now you've, you've developed from the Bantam and you're starting to get some sales. You had those first few you said were sort of like a factory, not factory built yet. And then you, you get a relationship with Sandparks. Did that Sandparks relationships and, and the game park start with the Bantam or did it come in when it became the Bathawk? It was actually the Bantam, um, John Ordendorf from Adder um, Elephant Park and Stephen Whitfield from Kruger National Park. They, um, they were operating the aircraft along with Bruce McDonald. He was, he was operating with the, with the Wildlife College. But we had a funny agreement with, with Kruger, with Stephen Whitfield in particular, who is a, is a great pilot and good friend. But he, um, he actually bought the first aircraft and he knew... Look, that we'd be making lots of aircraft. And, and the condition for Stephen buying that first aircraft was that as the aircraft progressed and, and got modded and improved, that all those, so he would take the risk, essentially, and all those improvements we would add onto his aircraft, but then he would advertise the aircraft for us. So. And, it was, and it, was, it was great for us, you know, just to be able to use his name and, and the Sandpark's name um, and under that umbrella, 
um, expand quickly. We we built we we were building four or five aircraft a month. You know now we're down to two three aircraft. But it, but uh, when we when we started uh, it was it was it was it was hot and it was the, it was a new thing out there and Sandparks had approved it and so so a lot of we owe a lot of our um, success to those type of guys in the in the beginning and um, and we we'll never forget that we'll never forget from where we came from. <laughs> sure. Now, did, so was this uh, this first guy? Is he coming in every three months for an upgrade, or did you say, look, you can come once a year and get all the mods? <laughs> <laughs> he uh, no, he would come. He's very particular. I, I think he's probably watching because I sent the link to him. But he he um, would come if there was something new. He would be there in a few hours. So, oh, wonderful. <laughs> he would just fly straight from the parking lot. Okay, you got to put it on. Okay, we put it on. <laughs> and some of the things was good, like it was some difficult stuff to to change. But we we kept our kept our word, and he he kept flying. And um, yeah, and he's yeah that that aircraft he flew for a thousand hours or something and sold it, and we oh, wow. moved on to the next. Okay, and, yeah. and so now what is the, the sort of ratio of your aircraft being used in utility, uh, you know, whether it's game viewing, whether it's uh, flying over the Vic Falls, whether it's, um, you know, coastal surveillance, and versus the private use, you know, like the breakfast clubs, the go flyaways and those sort of things? Yeah. Um, look, the, besides Silver Creek, which is just outside Rustenburg, which is the most active flying club in the, in the country, and they, there's more bat talks there than, than sand in Mozambique almost, they... Um, <laughs> There's usually one or two scattered around the place, and um, so 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 clubs that have massive amounts of aircraft, not so much. But but in terms of conservation, majority of of larger scale um, operations with a reserve that I would say exceeds sixty thousand hectares, fifty thousand hectares, has one of our planes or something similar. But but usually mostly ours because we make the only product in South Africa that's made for this, you know. Okay. And so, so I'd probably put it safely at 80 percent, 80 20, 80 percent um, working in conservation and surveillance, and 20 percent um, just general aviation. Okay, uh, here's a nice picture so I want to put up that you shared with me flying over the Vic Fall. So there's a, a tourism operation. So obviously it'll be one passenger, but but again a nice, great visibility, not encumbered by you know lots of fuselage or, or engine or anything it must be just a wonderful operator so what's the feedback like from the people that have bought aircraft for this application yeah majority, majority of the guys are just blown away you know um, what our aircraft has also allowed people to do a lot of is um is to to get into the aviation industry so to breaking breaking like grassroots aviation you know where it all starts and um when you when you start off in, a, in an aircraft where you, it's like a helicopter and you have 270 degree visibility and very simple controls, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it would be, be horrible to say it's hard to beat. Obviously, you, you can beat it, but um, it's it is difficult to beat. And, and, and the guys, usually what they do is they'll have one of our aircraft, they'll upgrade to something that's much faster because our aircraft aren't fast, they're certainly not made for speed. Um, and then, and then a few years later, they'll fly, and then they'll come back, and then they'll buy another one of our planes. And we have that often. Okay. We, have a, we probably have like a people that go away from our products. Say twenty percent of them, of the twenty percent, three or four percent of them will come back and buy another plane, and then fly that plane forever. Oh wow! And they won't get rid of it again. So <laughs> yeah, so that's an interesting. Stat. It's always nice when a when a customer comes back and says, "Man, those were the best flying years of my life." You know, I've got a big airplane, I've got an RV or whatever, but just to pop around for breakfast at Kitty Hawk to the whatever, Silk Creek again, <laughs> you jump in his little plane and he, and he sorts it out. So, yeah, so that certainly um, is one of, one of the biggest um, draw cards of our aircraft. Okay, cool. Now, so what are we talking about here? I know that uh, you've recently changed to a, a price structure based in dollars because the exchange rate's gone up and down and a lot of the sort of the heavy components are dollar base. So if I wanted to buy an aircraft from you, what is the price tag today? Yeah, they, they're $42,300 um, and it really hurts us. When I tell my dad the price, he cringes because it's completely, it's, it's almost against what we started off to do is, you know, to get everyone flying, to keep flying affordable. But, but when the engine is three quarters of the cost of the aircraft, mm. you, 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 you have very little, um, well, engine and instrument and propeller, you have very little room for movement. And, 
And it was only about two months ago, on the, at the onset of COVID-19, that we decided that it's, it's unfair on the customers and on us to keep the price in rand because we, it changes too much um, from day to day. So we actually just put the price in US dollars and we'll keep it, keep it there. And, and hopefully the rand gets stronger and it becomes more affordable for the local guys. The guys that our majority of our sales are international anyway. Okay. So, um, so that hasn't affected them. But the, the South African guys... It really burns us bad, badly to um, to have to to have to quote the aircraft in US dollars. It's not not uh, not nice for us that we've done it. So okay, to deal with it. But all right. So you mentioned the speed of this airplane too. So what is this sort of typical application speed? Uh, you know, you said it's a bit slow. Yeah. So our, the the range is sixty five to seventy five knots. Okay. Um, in a cruise, in a cruise with two up and one up, you can kind of cruise it. You can cruise up to 80 knots, you know, but that, then you're starting to use fuel and going against what the plane is made for. Sure. We're made to fly at 45, 50 knots with, um, with a little bit of flaps and using 12 liters an hour of fuel. That, I mean, that was, that's what, what the plane's designed for, just to, just to hang there, you know, to be the, to be the eyes in the sky and, and flying and hauling around at 80 knots. Is definitely makes that job much harder. So, so and we do have a lot of guys, especially the recreational guys, that say, "Come, we must put this on and put this on and got to just go. We just need an extra ten knots out of this piece." And we, we just we just tell the guys, Look, "It's it's going to be very hard to get ten knots out of that aircraft because it's a donkey and it's it's made to be a donkey." Okay. And so yeah, with the, with that comes so we, the sort of we, the robustness of it as well. But now you've also told me that. When, the, when you, your international clients up in Africa, they, they come down, they pick it up, and they fly it there. What was the record flight? You said 11 hours in this aircraft. That must have been quite a, quite a flight, all the way up to the Masai Mara. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was actually Louis, um, Louis Yodan, our, one of our, our very close um, supporters. Um, he's actually the owner of Silver Creek, the flying club where they have the most battles um, on the planet in one place. Um, and he, he's got no problems. He'll jump in an airplane now and fly to Egypt in one of our little things. He has absolutely no problem. And he, he stops drinking fluids or he reduces his fluid intake drastically before one of these long trips. So he'll, like two days before he's flying to the DRC, for example, he'll cut down on his fluids. And then um, so that he can, so he can survive easily an eight-hour leg in the air. And, um, and and if, if conditions, conditions prevent, prevent him from from um, <laughs> from landing or whatnot, he'll just he'll just stay in the air. And and he has done from several hours with weather weather related issues. You know, it, it's it's not legal in our plans to fly for longer than eight hours. But if it's if it's an emergency, you know, which it was in his situation, he he flew for eleven hours. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's incredible. Obviously, it's got to have a certain level of comfort to be able to uh, sustain yourself in that cockpit for so long. Let's okay. So you've you've uh, you've become the sort of uh, the supporter of uh, uh, the Bantams and more than two hundred and fifty Bantams out there flying in South Africa. You've got one hundred and seventy seven of the the Bathawks out there. So becoming a significant player, you know, nearly four hundred aircraft out there. So tell me then more specifically now. You've got these uh, uh, Southern Africa game parks that you have the relationship with. What is the sort of role and application there in the anti rana poaching? What is your involvement? Are, do you help train some of the people, the, the pilots? Do they send pilots to you and give them sort of low-level training experience? What is the involvement that you have with these parks? Yeah, so a lot of the parks, uh, I'll, we'll go through Botswana, for example, because that's a recent one and where we actually provided all the training, um, where we, we, we delivered 14 aircraft, and uh, that the, the the one picture that you've got with the aircraft over the mountains operating at about five and a half thousand foot, that's um, was Dan Hibbert um, leading a, leading one of the the deliveries of six aircraft or four aircraft, I can't remember which one it was. Um, and he um, yeah, so so he flew the aircraft up there. We flew them down, Kenil's kick collected the guys with his two ten and flew them down and, and we'd stay up there with a training team of Lester Lindsay and Rob Timkey did the training. Um, technical training and flight training and it, it was just like a wild world machine so we actually do low level training um, exercises anti poaching type training all visible policing stuff and then all the technical training as well with with sand parks they they they're more strict so they they require ppl minimum pilot license where these guys they don't even need it's military they don't even need a license as long as they you sign them out they, they can fly but um 
Sandpox sends PPL training, usually in no spray, and um, then after they've got their PPL, they can they can operate our aircraft. So that kind of moves out of our hands, and their their maintenance and their technical side is is very very strict, and it's and it's not done in house. It's it's outsourced. We we do we do most of their aircraft ourselves, the, the servicing and the maintenance and stuff. Okay. So, it's, but we but certainly no training of pilots or technicians. That's all. That's all done. Um, out of house. Okay, well, let me just uh, put up this other video clip of uh, the Rhino training, Rhino count training, just to get a sense of this aircraft. Well, all the pictures and the videos that you shared, there's always a pilot wearing either a t-shirt or a vest and the, the air wind blowing around. It just looks like a you know, nice summer's day outing. It looks like a fun aircraft to fly. It certainly is a lot of fun. Uh, that's why I, I told you when we spoke yesterday that I can't wait for you to come down here and actually try it yourself. It's hard to, it's hard to explain to you how, how great it is until you actually jump in it yourself and take it for a burn. Uh -huh. and, um, and certainly that open aspect, a little bit of wind in your face, um, isn't designed for the, for the Alps or the Himalayas or um, even more river on some mornings. But um, <laughs> generally, generally it's, it, you know, it encourages the adventurous spirit. Sure. Now, I've got a nice picture you shared again with a camo one. So tell me what's going on with this camo. It's India Delta Golf, uh, the, the, the camo aircraft. What's happening here? Yeah, so, so that was um, an experiment that we did. It was, that was actually my dad's aircraft until recently. Um, Andrew Flitton bought it um, down and took it down to the Free State. But um, we have got or directed our um, energy a lot into military applications for our aircraft. Um, we have developed uh, some hard points um, and mounted, mounted some of the aircraft with ordnance um, and had very, very successful very successful results, and um, not in South Africa, just for the record, <laughs> so we don't get into trouble. <laughs> but we've had, um, yeah, we, we, it, it, we, we they, the weapons are, they, they're pivotable, um, they've got stops, so you can't shoot your propeller off, or your lift strut, or your tire, or anything, it, it's all controlled, and um, very, very easy to shoot targets from the air, even with airsoft, um, which was what the trials were conducted with, um, you're able to, a small movement in the air, a couple of centimeters with your wrist is, is hundreds of meters on the ground. Um, so that was, that was a major success. We, we um, fitted the, on the pilot side, we fitted a 40 millimeter multiple grenade launcher um, <laughs> with, a, with the intention not of high velocity um, fragment grenades, but with the intention of deploying smoke and tear gas and stuff for like, crowd control and dispersion and stuff like that. And on the part, on the, on the, Pack side on the co-pilot side, we fitted a 5.56 mini me with a 200, 200 round magazine, which works unbelievably well. Very little recoil, um, and and mount, and the hard point mounts directly into the strongest part of our aircraft. So that was the, the military. That was the military side, and 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 it was a, a shift in our in our company, that, which we took. It was a big risk. Sure. Um, especially because we're very, very much conservation-based organization. Mm. Uh, we're fo focused on delivering aircraft to conservation organizations, and it could be taken the wrong way, you know, making a gunship, essentially, mm. um, even though it's a, just a tiny little gunship, like a, <laughs> like a wasp hornet <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. But um, it, it didn't. It didn't. It went completely opposite, and, and, and it was it received with um, appreciation from right throughout Africa and we've got we, we're working on some very very nice contracts at the moment from West Africa right through to like Sudan type of stuff and then and, and then down south 
Okay. And, um, and a very interesting machine to operate. Slightly different characteristics with the weapons on. Sure. But um, because she's so docile, and like I said early, early on, donkey-like, um, it doesn't really have like negative um, effects on the flight characteristics. She already is such a dirty airframe, um, and that's why it makes it fly so easily. That mm. adding these big, uh, cumbersome, um, aerodynamically inefficient um, <laughs> objects all over the place it made it very little difference. Um, okay. It was we we were surprised, but it it was like that. So, so that's that's what the military. That's the camo that you see there. Um, which is which is very strange because <laughs> camouflage should actually be blue because you don't see the camouflage from from <laughs> above you see it from underneath. Sure, but um, the uh, the army's like the the camo fabric. So every every different military that we supply to has different colours, mm. and even in Botswana, three different sections have have three different colours aircraft. So oh well, well I, mean, I, I hope yeah. uh, I hope um, there's somebody from the South African military also listening, uh, paying attention. Uh, in my time when I flew in the South African Air Force, we had the Cessna 185, a great workhorse for the the awesome. low-level vis reconnaissance, etc., on the borders, and and they've been phased out many many years ago, and there hasn't been a suitable replacement. So this this role in not only uh, if you could have the hard points and things, but as you mentioned, the smoke marker. You know, you, you drop the smoke and, and you make it that the, the the whoever it is is identified easily. We don't have to go in the offensive with the necessarily grenade launchers and, and weapons, but that is an option. So I hope perhaps there's yeah. an opportunity to to supply the South African Air Force or even the uh, the recce teams. They were experimenting with microlites and and having an airborne wing of them. So have you had any yeah. any interest from the South African military? We we had a tiny little bit of interest at one stage, um, uh, and it was just someone that had contacts that wanted to propose the a project and a trial with them um, with the SANDF, um, and um, and it didn't kind of gain momentum. But we were going through such a we're still going through such a weird time with our military, unfortunately, with um, lack of funds, and mm -hmm. we can't keep the current aircraft in the air. Uh, you know, to go for them to go and buy mm -hmm. a stack of new aircraft, or be there, or be it much cheaper. Uh, you know that's where that's where they they've got to start thinking about that. Look, if they sell one of these things, they buy a hundred of these things, <laughs> sure. and and five years of operational costs and twenty pilots. Mm. So maybe maybe there is an opportunity there. We've certainly have tried knocking on some doors, um, and and it's and it's much more complicated here than than in other African countries where we do operate, where there's kind of one person that you okay. you knock on his door and eventually opens the door and he says, "What do you?" keep pestering me about it and you say just try this please and they try it and you and then they love it mm. so if we could get that opportunity here you know, i'll be very grateful i'll thank you thank you notes every morning <laughs> <laughs> and even i'm thinking in the sort of the inshore maritime patrol that you know uh, th there's a, a great opportunity we've got such a vast coastline too and our, our maritime capability is has been significantly reduced over the years too but anyway we'll have that as a conversation another day there's some people asking or, or posting some comments um so uh, Franco is saying that the, the, the high engine makes the aircraft uh, much shorter as well. So I'm sure that's a nice feature that you that you guys can can advertise too. Um, yeah. Um, people were saying here. Um, one of the uh, Jisa or uh, Jika Pinta Coelho, one of the, owned one of the first Bantams in South Africa and had so much fun. So there's another yes. advert for you. And uh, yeah, Jika. <laughs> Jika. And there's also. Um, Okay, so let, let's get to, to some of the, uh, you know what, this, this has gone on long and I think we've got so much to discuss that I think perhaps there's a good opportunity for us to, to get to a round two and, uh, and have another, another conversation. But before we get there, I want to just flash up one more picture here, which is very interesting for me, is that, or well, another couple of pictures actually, there's a picture of a Formo flying, it looks like at sunset, uh, aircraft, two of them, and then you've even got uh, a three ship. So that's, uh, that gives me some encouragement that the versatility of this airplane, there's some formation flying. Is this uh, people going on a fly-in together or are there some people that do actively do some formation flying with this? Or what is your experience with formation in this aircraft? Yeah, so we, uh, uh, we're blessed to have our whole family um, pilots. And um, so my, my dad and my boat and my cousin and my other boat, they, they, they will jump in four or five aircraft and we'll fly in formation, it's, 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 my cousin just needs to stay at the back because he just decides to turn every now and then. <laughs> but, um, but generally, but they, like, like I keep mentioning how docile the aircraft is and, and, and slow movements, you know, it's not, it's not nippy. It's certainly not a, a blue angel in, a, in an F-18 
mm. hornets. You know, <laughs> so you, you got there is some room for error, but the the masters. My old man is certainly one of the masters of formation flying here in the low fault. But um, up there, or Louis or Don, the same guy who flies these aircraft of ours all over the place. Okay. Him and the boys from Silver Creek, you know, Sean Cronin and Ariane Scarp, all those guys, they they um they, they fly in formation every day. they they live on the on the runway state and they jump in their battle in the evening and they fly in formation. So they 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 probably are the best now in the in the in the country in flying flying tight formers and um and they love it. And you see, I mean those those few picks that's them on a random morning, you know, going for a going for a little flip. So they, so they 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 get better and better as time goes by, certainly. Well, it certainly looks like a lot of fun, Terry. It's been a lot of fun chatting with you as well. Um, I know that uh, that you've you've invited me several times to come through. As soon as lockdown's over, we're going to make a trip down and meet up in person. That's going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot more to talk about. I've got all these notes here, and I, I haven't been able to get to. But I think let's have a round two, and we'll do it live from your uh, production facility on the farm. Great, Alex. And I look forward to it. Thank you very much for having us, eh? or oh, for me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been great. Thanks for your time. Well, folks, it's been a wonderful conversation. Lots more to talk about. Thank you for your support and joining the show. If you would please share with somebody who would be interested in, in having a look at this conversation, share, like, comment, subscribe, do all those nice things. It's been wonderful. Thank you for your time. Be safe out there.